In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light Bud. And the darkness God called Surly. And God saw the light, and God said, It is <laughs> gross. Ugh, who brewed this stuff? Jesus, get in here and turn this watery swill into wine coolers or something. <laughs> And welcome to Beer and Theology. My name is Scott Stivers, and in this episode we'll be drinking Caribou Slobber, which is a homebrew recipe kit from Minnesota's own Northern Brewer. Now, this was my first foray into home brewing, and it was fun. Um, in fact, I even have an Irish stout kit ready to go next. But Beer and Theology isn't meant to be primarily about home brewing. I thought I should try to brew a beer before I started talking about it, so if you've been a little disappointed by the last three episodes of Beer and Theology, fear not. This time we're going to talk about a beer and about theology. A few quick reminders before we start. Now, I might use big theological terms, um, and the biggest theological term each episode uh, shall henceforth be known as the buzzword for the day, uh, because by the time we get around to talking about it, I might be a little buzzed. This will not be a systematic exposition of theology. Let's just call it a um, less inhibited conversation that could wind up going just about anywhere. I mean, I may end up making comparisons between things that usually don't go together. That's my favorite uh, technique called juxtaposition. And finally, I welcome collaboration. I'll do my best to present my beliefs both about beer and about theology in a respectful way. And I hope you'll do the same in the comments below. So if you enjoy talking about life, the universe, and everything while drinking a beer or two, to, uh, shall we say, unbutton the straitjacket of doctrine? Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! And your imagination? Then hit like on this video and the subscribe button below, and turn on notifications so you know when I put a new one up. Uh, so let's get started with beer and theology. Now, as I mentioned before, today we will be talking about my own creation, caribou slobber. Well, okay. Not exactly my own, in the sense that I didn't make it up from my imagination from scratch. I mean, I did m make it, so it, it's kind of like a cover song. You know, I didn't write the song, but so it's not my song. But it is my performance of the song. In fact, uh, Northern Brewer didn't even come up with the uh, uh, song so to speak. It's a song written by Big Sky, a band out of Missoula, Montana. Wait, not a band. What was I talking about? Big Sky Brewing Company in Missoula, Montana makes Moose Drool, which they tout as the best American brown ale in the world, which might be true. It's at least the best selling beer brewed in Montana. Now, I have some Moose Drool here for comparison, and because you probably won't ever get to taste the batch of Caribou Slobber, which is, again, my cover of Northern Brewer's cover of Moose Drool. Uh, you may find other covers or remixes of Moose Drool out there under names like Deer Drivel or Elk Froth or Moot Jack Ooze or Taruka Spit. But I'd recommend trying the original Moose Drool uh, to get an idea of what brown ale is all about. Now, I find Moose Drool to have kind of a toasty coffee smell. It's got a uh, reddish-brown color with uh, no perceivable microscopic bits. Sorry, guys. It's light and refreshing on the tongue. 
doesn't have any carbonation burn. I, remember the first time you ever had soda as a kid? You know, some kids are traumatized, but me, I loved it. You know, it tastes uh, sweet and malty with a hint of uh, forest. Now, I wouldn't drink it with a pizza or anything. It's not a beer and pizza kind of beer, but uh, you know, I would drink it outside with a steak fresh off the grill in the summer. You know, I, I feel like you could have a pretty heavy meal with this and not feel like you were going to explode. And with an ABV, uh, that's alcohol by volume, with an ABV of only 5%, it won't knock you over if you drink two or three cans. Okay, now for the caribou slobber. I'm really excited. Uh, now caribou slobber smells like... What? I like it. It smells like... It's kind of like rice. It smells like wild rice. Um, it looks, now this is just dark. It's brown, it's like moustrel I could see through, caribou slobber, uh, not so much. Um, so that means the microscopic bits are present. Uh, good microscopic bits, um, rice. The smell a little dusty maybe though. And it tastes like It also tastes sweet. Definitely no carbonation burn. Um, very similar. This one, I think, has a little bit of aftertaste that comes from the fact that there's a lot of uh, minerals in the water here at my house. But I brewed it with distilled water, so maybe it got water from when I was rinsing it out in there. Um, it's really easy to contaminate a uh, home brew, so, you know, clearly I don't have the same equipment as a moose drool. But uh, caribou slobber has, yeah, just a little bit of an extra um, flavor at the end of almost like a metallic flavor, but not terrible. But other than that, very sweet and very much like wild rice, I think. Unfortunately, I have no idea what the ABV, the alcohol by volume, is because I don't have the equipment to measure that yet. And I'm not sure what the OG was. Not <laughs> OG. That's original gravity, not original gangsta. I can't believe I just tried to say that. Original gravity is how much sugar can be fermented into alcohol before the yeast is added to the wort. So you discover how much sugar there is to figure out how much sugar there is to eat to be turned into alcohol. Yeah. To get from original gravity to alcohol by volume requires math. And I don't do math here on Beer and Theology for obvious reasons. So if someone wants to explain the math in the comments below, be my guest. But all in all, I love it. <laughs> Not because it's the best beer I've ever tasted, but because it's the first beer I have ever made. And that's the thing about beer. You know, wine just happens. Author William Bostwick writes, making it, wine, making it can be as easy as letting fruit juice sit out too long. Now beer, on the other hand, needs to be made. It needs to be created. And that is today's buzzword. And I am a little buzzed. Creation. Now I thought it would be appropriate since we are just beginning this series and talking about a beer I made to start at the beginning and talk about creation. You know, easy enough, right? We all grew up with the with the story and the animals and the trees and the everything and the light. Easy, right? This will be easy. Nope. Now before we even start, let's take a sip. Let's be clear that whenever we talk about one thing in theology, we'll likely bump into other things that we don't have time to explore. Now, some will be outside of Christianity. For example, there are creation stories from around the world that are very interesting, but we'll be focusing on the Christian perspective. Also, we'll bump into other theological concepts in this episode. I, I might bump into Christology or Soteriology or Eschatology. All of these are interesting, and, and we can talk about them over another beer in another episode. But as an aside, if you have a topic you'd like covered, let me know in the comments if you like any of those eschatologies or ologies or any ology you want. Or it doesn't even have to have an ology. Finally, 
I know that what I believe in isn't what everyone else believes. All I'm asking is that we all keep an open mind and consider the question, yeah, but what if this is true? I mean, like, what if our galaxy is just like one atom in God's fingernail? One tiny atom in my fingernail could be, could be one little tiny universe. Well, I'm gonna jump right into the middle. Oh, look at those microscopic bits. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump right into the middle of the hot buttons by saying there are at least two creation stories in the Bible. Now, in the first one, beginning with in the beginning, which seems redundant to say. Anyway, the first one, we get a God's eye view. I mean, the second one, starting with this is the account of heaven and earth, and how they were created, then we get more of a boots on the ground perspective. Or maybe I should say a boots made from the ground perspective. Now, there are some continuity issues if you want to fuse the two stories into one. You know, not like you're watching a movie and in one shot the main character's shirt is like buttoned and in the next it's, it's a totally different color. Yeah that kind of continuity issue. <laughs> you see what I did there? I, yeah, change it. It was obvious. Too, too obvious? No, no. <laughs> now, I said at least two. Now, the Genesis accounts tell us what God created, but they don't say much about why. Now, a word of warning though, Dietrich Bonhoeffer points out that we are in the middle of the story and that, uh, to quote, we must bear in mind very clearly that we hear of the beginning only in the middle. We can't step outside of the middle of the story and go back to see the real beginning, which is too bad. I wish I knew what God was doing before the beginning. Um, founder of the Lutheran Church, Martin Luther himself, was asked uh, what he thought God was doing before the beginning, and he said, um, probably after a big swig, he was cutting canes for people who asked such useless questions. Yikes! Still, there must be a clue. I mean, after all, Genesis isn't the only book in the Bible that starts with, in the beginning. Mm hmm? The Gospel of John begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, but the darkness has not understood it. Hmm. Let's assume for the moment that for John, the Word is Jesus. Then, we actually read in Paul's letter to the Colossians, and he explicitly talks about Jesus. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Okay, okay. All things were created by him and for him? Whoa, that's interesting. Now, follow me here for a second. I think a lot of us grew up under the assumption that um, God created the world, it was good, we messed it up, Eve messed it up sometimes, that gets thrown in there, and God had to send Jesus to fix it. Right? Creation, fall, sin, the cross, redemption. Right? But if Jesus came to fix it, doesn't that kind of make Jesus plan B? Now, what if Eve never ate the apple, which wasn't really an apple, and yes, that's foreshadowing for next time. Um, you know, not, you know, notwithstanding all of the gender issues that have happened as a result of Eve getting blamed for this whole fall thing, if Eve had never ate the apple, 
Would God have needed to send Jesus if there was no OS? You know, original gravity, original gangsta, original sin, get it? Okay, from now on, that's what I'm gonna call original sin from now on, the OS. <laughs> yeah, the things Caribou Slobber makes me say. <laughs> Would God have sent Jesus if there was no original sin? I can hear Martin Luther asking God to cut a cane on account of this useless question. Thanks. Seriously, for us Christians, shouldn't Jesus be plan A? And Jesus Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension is plan A. Everything, time, history, planets, stars, light, people, cats, dogs, living together, it'll be anarchy, or, uh, sorry, <clears throat> sorry, everything, life, the universe, and everything are created for Jesus. If Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together, that means that our whole solar system could be like one tiny atom in the fingernail of some other giant being. Dude! My head hurts. Dang, this theology stuff can be bizarre. So, let's just uh, stop for now and uh, let some of the possibilities sink in. I mean, along with the deer drivel. Or, I mean, uh, caribou slobber, uh, moose drool, or, yeah, okay. Caribou slobber, moose, no wonder everything is getting confusing. Mine's better. At this point, I think we should go back to Genesis for a minute and remember what God said at the end of each day of creation. It is good. And why is it good? Well, it's like Bonhoeffer tells us. It's good only in the way that the creaturely can be good because the Creator views it, acknowledges it as His own, and says of it, it is good. And I guess that's all I can say about my batch of caribou slobber. I see it, I taste it, I acknowledge it as my own, and I say of it, it is good. May you always remember, regardless of what anyone else may say to you, God sees you, God acknowledges you as God's own, and God says of you, it is good. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Beer and Theology. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button below and subscribe to the channel. Uh, the next episode, we will try a beer from my favorite neighborhood brewery, Back Channel Brewing. Uh, support your local brewery. And the next episode's buzzword will be fall. In the meantime, remember, beer is proof that God wants us to be happy.